Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, the saber-toothed salmon has had a rebranding, the intelligence of T-Rex has been brought into question, spiders have been spotted on Mars, and much, much more. Also, we now have a TikTok and are uploading content there, so be sure to follow us, please. Starting us off this week, the spiders from Mars have been spotted by the Mars Express spacecraft. Now to be clear, they're not actual spiders, and as far as we know, they don't have a band. They are actually the result of sunlight falling on layers of carbon dioxide ice at the Martian poles, which causes the ice at the bottom of the layers to turn to gas and break through the upper ice layers, taking dark dust up with it, which bursts through the ice like geysers. The dust then falls back down and settles into these incredible tendril-like patterns, which have been nicknamed spiders. The cluster of spiders to the left of the image is located around the outskirts of a Martian region named Inca City, so called because of the geometric lines that look somewhat like Inca ruins. The origin of this landmark is still not certain, but they may have been sand dunes that turned to stone over time, perhaps they are structures related to glaciers, or they may have been formed from rising lava. The images from the Mars Express are absolutely fantastic and beautifully capture the southern polar region of the Red Planet. Up next, we have the most amazing news to share about the orca calf that was trapped in a lagoon for five weeks after her mother died, called Brave Little Hunter. She is finally free. She became trapped on Saturday, March 23rd, when her mother, a big orca known as Spong, became stranded in Little Espinosa Inlet, which is located on the western side of Vancouver Island. It is believed that Spong, who was pregnant, became stranded after an attempt at capturing a harbour seal whose remains were found close by. She became trapped in a trough-like depression and, in spite of attempts to help her, she tragically died. Many attempts were made to get Brave Little Hunter out of the lagoon, but nothing worked. The last attempt was halted after she was seen to eat 18 kilograms of seal meat. This meant that there was the possibility that she could be lured out of the lagoon, and this is essentially what happened. On Thursday evening, federal fisheries officers and members of the Eha Eslat First Nation fed her chunks of seal meat, gradually leading her towards the narrow gap, and at some point, she made it through. She had to pass under a bridge where the channel was very narrow and the water very shallow. But at around 2.30 a.m. Friday morning, at high tide in very calm, glassy waters, she did it. That evening, she had been seen enthusiastically breaching and tail slapping, almost as if she knew that this was the last night she was spending in the lagoon and that she was going to be heading back out into the ocean to find her family. Later on Friday morning, she was spotted heading down Espinosa Inlet towards Esperanza Inlet and the open ocean. She was being followed by a boat with a marine mammal rescue team on board, which was keeping an eye on her progress. At the time of writing, there has been no more news about her. We can only hope that she makes it into the ocean and is able to meet up with the pod she belongs to. Her grandmother is the matriarch of the pod and she has aunts, uncles and cousins in it. So she is assured of a loving welcome. It's possible that another pod may adopt her and there are some other pods which contain family members, including one in which her great grandmother is the matriarch. If there is any further news, we will let you know next week. First up in the paleontology news for this week, there's been a published response to a paper from last year which claimed that theropod dinosaurs, such as T-Rex, had baboon-like cognition. This previous study used fossil endocasts of the brains of extinct dinosaurs, plus comparisons with living animals, to reconstruct telencephalic neuron counts in dinosaurs and pterosaurs, concluding that large theropods, such as T. rex, were exceptionally intelligent animals that may have even been capable of tool use, whereas sauropods and most ornithischian dinosaurs had much smaller brains and were ectothermic or cold-blooded. As this new research explains, this not only challenges established views on the biology of extinct dinosaurs, but does also raise the interesting question of whether or not the estimates of neuron counts can help the study of fossil animals. The team of paleontologists on this study find several issues with the previous work, and present revised estimates of neuron counts for dinosaurs that result in significantly lower values for large theropods. They find no compelling evidence to suggest that big theropods had relative brain sizes significantly above those of living reptiles, 
or that their neuron counts were particularly exceptional. They also caution that depending on the methods used, very different neuron density values can be recovered for extinct animals. And so basing claims of intelligence or behaviours on these should be avoided. They additionally find that neuron number estimates and relative brain size are just not good proxies for predicting the complexity of extinct dinosaurs' cognition or its metabolic rate. The authors also argue that instead of relying solely on these estimates to come to conclusions about dinosaur biology, as the previous work did, studies should utilise all aspects of our understanding of paleobiology, as this will provide more reliable reconstructions of these animals. So basically, T. rex having baboon-like intelligence is just not realistic or supported by the data we currently have. Still, this debate will undoubtedly open up some interesting new avenues of research, and it's good to see these claims of exceptional intelligence in dinosaurs actually being tested. Also in the paleontology news for this week is the very exciting report of some huge dinosaur footprints in China. These tracks are preserved at a site in southeastern China that dates to sometime around 96 million years ago during the late Cretaceous period, and the locality displays over 240 identifiable dinosaur tracks from various lineages. The ones described in this paper, however, are those made by Dinonocosaurians. The group that includes the so-called raptors, the dromaeosaurs, the troodontids, and others. Twelve tracks were identified at the site that were created by Dinonocosaurs, and they were found to fall into two distinct types. Some were smaller in size, about 11 centimetres in length, and can be assigned to the already named Ichnotaxon Velociraptor Ichnus. An Ichnotaxon is a scientific name for a species only known from trace fossils. These tracks would have been made by a small dromaeosaur of around a metre in length, so something quite like Velociraptor itself. The other kinds of Deinonychosaur tracks identified at the site, however, were made by something much bigger. The tracks measured about 36 centimetres in length and have been named as a new Ichnotaxon called Fujianopus yingliangi. This dinosaur likely stood at about 1.8 metres tall at the hip, making it comparable in size to the largest known of the Deinonychosaurs. However, based on the track's anatomy and the toe's proportions, it seems to have been made by a gigantic troodontid. This therefore indicates that gigantism independently evolved in at least three different groups within the Deinonychosaurs. The Eudromiosaurs with Euteraptor and others, the Unenlargiids with Ostroraptor, and now also the Troodontids with Fujianopus. Interesting, Interestingly, at this time in Asia, these giant troodontids were apparently coexisting with early large-bodied tyrannosaurs too, as well as some big-bodied allosaurids, a really fascinating new study significantly expanding our understanding of the possible size ranges of these theropod dinosaurs. Up next, we've got another theropod dinosaur species, this time from England. It's based on two partial hind limbs that have been known about since the 1800s, but until now have not been named as a species. They do show various anatomical features that allow them to be recognised as something distinct, and so they've been named as the new species Dawn Raptor Normani, with Dawn coming from an Anglo-Saxon term for the area of England that today includes Dorset, where these bones were found. The bones came from Charmouth, near to Lyme Regis on the Jurassic coast of England, and they are said to have come from the Blue Lias formation, which dates to the very earliest Jurassic. However, some previous research did find that these bones likely came from the slightly younger Charmouth Mudstone Formation. Dawn Raptor is now one of the earliest known Jurassic theropods, and based on the evolutionary analysis done in this paper, it may represent a distinct and very early branching lineage of neotheropods. So another great dinosaur discovery. Some exciting prehistoric fish news next, as paleontologists have reported on new fossils revealing that the so-called saber-toothed salmon was actually not saber-toothed at all. Oncorhynchus rastosus was once called Smilodon ichthys rastosus, due to it being thought that it was different enough from the modern salmon to be included within its own genus, and because paleontologists thought it had a pair of large teeth projecting downwards from the tip of its upper jaw, based on the fossils they had found, leading them to name it after the saber-toothed cat Smilodon. However, it was later found to be similar to the modern salmon genus Oncorhynchus, and so Smilodon ichthys is now an outdated name. Anyway, this new study has reported on more complete fossil material and used CT reconstruction techniques to show that the apparent sabre teeth of this salmon actually projected out sideways from its snout, like tusks. 
They have therefore suggested calling this species the spiked toothed salmon instead. The spiked toothed salmon is still an incredibly impressive animal, being the largest salmon to ever live and potentially reaching 2.7 meters in length. It's known from fossils found in rocks along the Pacific Northwest of North America, as well as in Japan, and lived between 12 to 5 million years ago. Although some sexual dimorphism has been found in these prehistoric salmon, both males and females possessed large spikes on the snouts, and they may have been used in predator defense, fighting with other members of their own species, or potentially to excavate nests to lay their eggs in. So goodbye, saber-toothed salmon, and hello, spike-toothed salmon. We've got more exciting fish updates next, as some complete body fossils of the prehistoric crushing shark Tychodus have been discovered, finally revealing what this mysterious fish looked like after nearly two centuries of uncertainty. You may remember that Ben did a video on these incredible sharks for last year's Shark Week, so it's very exciting to finally have complete fossils and to see what they looked like. As sharks have cartilaginous skeletons that do not fossilize very well, the fossil record of Tychodus has almost been entirely made up of isolated teeth or sometimes nearly complete dentitions. The teeth of Tychodus are quite incredible, with many complex folds and patterns making them very well suited for crushing hard prey items, and these teeth have been found in Cretaceous aged rocks on almost every continent. Here's an example of one from Morocco. You can see all those amazing folds and how the tooth is rather dome-shaped, perfect for crushing. This was a really good day to choose not to have my nails painted oh, yeah. for the first time in months. Well, this new study describes six specimens from Mexico that preserve body outlines and much of the skull and skeleton, and they are just absolutely stunning. Paleontologists have therefore been able to tell that Tychodus was a lamniform shark, commonly known as the mackerel sharks, and including the modern species such as the white shark, megamouth shark, sand tiger sharks, and others. They also find that Tychodus was a fast swimming shark, which occupied a specialised predatory niche not really seen in any other extinct or living sharks, likely primarily feeding on hard-shelled, free-swimming animals such as ammonites and sea turtles, instead of invertebrates that lived on the sea floor. They also proposed that the extinction of Tychodus may have had something to do with the emergence of mosasaurs that occupied similar niches. It's a really amazing new study, and it's just wonderful to finally have a much better understanding of these incredible sharks after so long. And finally for the news this week, a new study of the evolution of terror birds has been published. The terror birds, members of the family Forosaurachidae, were apex predators in South America and existed for over 50 million years. Analyzing a new evolutionary tree of these intimidating predators, paleontologists have clarified some of the interrelationships of different species, while also finding that there were rarely any overlap in the body sizes among different subfamilies of terror birds that lived at the same time. This therefore seems to indicate that the different lineages were niche partitioning, occupying different roles in the environment where they co-occurred. Gigantism was also found to have evolved once in a group including the forest rackings, which contains the famous Titanus, which made it into North America, and the slightly older Physornithines. The Physornithines were the first giant members of the group, but then they went extinct and the Forosaurachines appeared soon after, initially being better suited for fast running, but then later giving rise to even larger species and taking over the role of gigantic terror birds. So the body size and diversity of these amazing birds seems to have been driven by competitive exclusion, meaning that species of similar sizes that occupied similar niches were preventing from coexisting with one another. It's a fascinating look at the evolutionary history of these iconic prehistoric birds. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. As I mentioned at the start, we now also have a TikTok account, which you should go follow for more paleontological news, updates, and short form videos about various extinct animals. And if you haven't already, be sure to follow the Benji Thomas Instagram account too. You could also follow me on Instagram at Miss Amelia Evans if you like. It was in the, it wasn't me, it was Ben did that. Thanks for watching.